So I'm Thomas Nasolaris, and I'm co-organizer of this symposium along with Kendra Kay. Uh, we want to start by thanking the conference organizers for giving us a chance uh, to assemble this group of excellent researchers to talk about issues in visual representation and to explain and, and advocate for the particular approaches they take. Uh, instead of providing an overview for all the talks, um, we've asked each speaker to try to keep their talks down to 15 minutes, if possible, um, field a couple questions from the audience, and then at some point during their talk, uh, answer some discussion questions, namely, what is the most critical open question about visual representation, and uh, also discuss perhaps the uh, methodological or analytical developments that they think will be necessary uh, to, to make that happen. Um, so with that, I will start with the, the first talk of the night, which is my own. Visual representation in absence of retinal stimulation, uh, which is usually uh, referred to as mental imagery. So uh, for most people, mental imagery is experienced as an imprecise approximation to seeing. But mental imagery has a long and rather divisive history in uh, <clears throat> experimental psychology uh, research as well as philosophy. And there have been a number of dissenting views. Okay, so one of them is that uh, mental images are not in fact visual. And even though I don't think this represents the consensus opinion, or even the opinion of most people in, in the field, um, the, the field has struggled with this issue for actually several decades because it's, it's very hard to show that em mental imagery engages um, uh, visual cortex at, at the earliest levels, in primary visual cortex or early visual areas. So what I wanted to try to do today is present some compelling evidence that mental images are in fact visual representations and then move on to suggest a, a computational role for mental imagery as a component of predictive signaling. So the specific question I'm going to focus on is whether or not representations of low-level visual features contribute to mental imagery. And by low-level visual features, I basically mean everything that you can summarize with a Gabor, a Gabor filter. And I'm showing four of them here. So that's retinotopic, location, orientation, and spatial frequency. Now, there's been a lot of work on a related but importantly different question, which is, are activation patterns in early visual areas during imagery and perception similar? And it's been shown recently uh, by a number of studies that if you train a pattern classifier to discriminate patterns of activity that are evoked by perceiving stimuli, that that classifier can then be used to discriminate uh, activity patterns evoked by imagining the same stimuli. So here is a figure from a, an excellent recent paper by Lee et al. showing the, the uh, decoding accuracy of a classifier that was trained to discriminate uh, 10 distinct objects and then applied to activity evoked when subjects were asked to imagine those same objects. Okay. So chance was at 10% and in V1 we're getting significantly above chance decoding accuracy. So this is an important um, result. It establishes that representations during mental imagery and perception are similar. They're similar somehow. Um, the question I'd like to uh, focus on is why? Why are they similar? What is it about these two patterns of representation that make them overlap enough that a, a, a classifier will generalize from perception to imagery? This is a hard question to answer because there are multiple sources of variation, even in V1. Okay? So here's just a small subset of papers uh, showing uh, um, that activity in V1 and lower level visual areas can be modulated by things other than low level visual features, other than Gabor's. Okay? This, prob this problem gets even more complicated when you try to use complex imagery, whether for your perceptual or imagery side of, of your experiments. Because the more complex the image, the more potential sources of variation you introduce into the activity that you're recording. And I think this is, uh, brings us to what is a, a fundamental limitation of multi-voxel pattern classifiers, which is that they indicate that patterns of activity are similar or discriminable, but don't indicate why. 
And here is a figure from a recent paper uh, illustrating a state of affairs where uh, it would be possible to decode the scariness of an animal from a, a population of voxels that encode, independently encode the size and predacity of the animals. And it wouldn't be possible to determine uh, that these were the dimensions being encoded by the possibility uh, simply by decoding scariness. Okay? And this problem, again, is just going to get more complicated when you start trying to discriminate between complex images. So um, that's why um, in pursuing this mental imagery, um, this question about mental imagery, we've decided to use an approach that we've been calling voxel-wise modeling and decoding. And I'll describe exactly how that works in this case. Um, it's different from multivariate pattern classifiers, and it's, um, it, it's, um, it's, it's uh, importantly different in the case uh, of studying mental imagery. Um, and I'll explain why in a minute. So our approach uh, was to ask subjects to memorize five works of art. Okay. So um, we then put those subjects in a scanner. And the, uh, we scanned at 7 Tesla at the Center for Magnetic Resonance Research at the University of Minnesota. We scanned roughly the back third of the subject's brains. And we asked them during a set of model fitting runs to fixate on a point, the center of the screen, while passively observing thousands of, excuse me, roughly 1,500 uh, randomly selected color photographs. Right. Then they sat through a set of perception and imagery runs. During the perception runs, uh, they were presented with the five artworks that they'd previously memorized. But each artwork was preceded by a three-letter Q, okay, which they had learned previously to associate with the artwork. The imagery runs were identical in every way, except that the three-letter Q was followed by a screen that was just slightly lighter than the, um, the baseline illumination. And that was an indication to the subject that they were to project their mental image of this, this memorized artwork onto the screen. The data from the model fitting trials were used to fit voxel-wise receptive field models, or more generally known as encoding models, for every one of the voxels in our scan. And then used to decode perceived or imagined artworks using a method of decoding known as image identification, which I'll uh, explain in just a moment. So the really key aspect of our approach is this stage where we fit an encoding model. The encoded model we use is fairly simple. It's a bucket of Gabor's, all right? And Im importantly, what it allows us to do is to generate a prediction for every voxel in our, in our scan window, um, a prediction of the signal that we would record or measure in that voxel given any arbitrary stimulus that we happen to present to the subject. Okay? And it just generates those predictions using a linear combination of these filter outputs. There's a nonlinearity in there, which I'm not showing. But uh, these, the model weights, or the linear combination, is estimated separately for every single voxel. So if you have 100,000 voxels, you're going to get 100,000 different models. Right. Now, um, what, what, what we're going to do with this model is use it to actually decode mental images. And this is an important point, because we're going to use the predictions of the encoding model to do our decoding. That means that the only way that the decoding can work, the only way we can decode a mental image, is if this set of Gabor's that's inside the model is actually doing its job. It's actually predicting activity evoked during mental imagery. So in order to find the uh, sets of voxels, the population of voxels that are actually um, well described or well characterized by this uh, rather simple model, um, we just look at the, the prediction accuracy of the model, which is just the correlation between the model's predictions and the measured responses on a, um, a set of held out images. So here's a histogram showing the uh, number of voxels versus model prediction accuracy. There's a big peak at zero, which means that the model actually doesn't account for much of the variation in most of the voxels in the scan. But there's this heavy tail showing that the model actually does a good job of accounting for, uh, accounting for the activity in a subpopulation of the voxels. And you can see that heavy tail much better in this log scale inset. And you can see that um, the, the tail is occupied primarily by V1 and V2, and to some extent by um, V3 and V4. 
So in order to factor out the, or to, to, to segregate the voxels that are well tuned to these low level visual features, we uh, rank ordered every voxel according to how well this model predicts their activity. And then we bin them into groups of a thousand. Um, with this procedure, we end up with a thousand voxel, a thousand populations, each containing a thousand voxels. And they vary from those that are poorly um, predicted by the model to those that are uh, uh, accurately predicted by the model, and everything in between. We then subject each one of these populations to a mental image identification analysis. This is how it works. Um, the activity that is uh, recorded by imagining, say, this, uh, this painting by El Greco is compared to the predicted responses uh, of the model when fed this same target image. Okay? So they're imagining El Greco, the target image is this El Greco painting. We run that through the model, get predicted responses, and we just measure the correlation between the measured responses and the predicted ones. Then we grab a thousand random photographs, okay, none of which were included in our experiment, and we run each of those through the model as well. And then we get predicted responses to these random photographs. We correlate those predicted responses to measured responses. So if, if this voxel population is encoding low-level visual features, then the correlation between measured responses and the predicted responses for the target uh, image should be much higher, or uh, on, on average it should be higher, than the correlations between measured responses and the predicted responses to random images. So we call it image identification because we're picking out the mental image from a set of a thousand or however many other images we want. This can, I mean, we've, we've run this analysis up to 50 million images. Um, and then we just, for each one of these random images, we calculate whether we got a hit or a miss. Okay, whether we were able to identify the target image or the random image is most likely. So uh, again, I want to stress that this can only work if the encoding model is an accurate representation of what's going on during mental imagery. Okay, otherwise, the model is going to fail. All right? If this model is spitting out garbage, it's not going to be any more correlated with the measured responses um, than the model um, spits out when you have a random photograph being run through it. So this is, this is the main result of our study. Um, on the y-axis we have image, identif excuse me, image identification accuracy, and on the x we have a model prediction accuracy. Each one of these dots corresponds to a single population of a thousand voxels. And then his position along the x-axis is an indication of how well the model is doing of predicting the activity in that set of voxels. His position on the y-axis is an indication of how well we're doing at decoding. And in the, in the units we're measuring, 1,000 is the best you can do and 500 is chance. So if we look at the blue line, we're looking at the median decoding accuracy of populations as we go from those which are poorly tuned, not tuned at all, to, to low-level uh, visual features, to those that are um, uh, exquisitely tuned to these features, and we see that decoding accuracy depends monotonically on the uh, prediction accuracy of the model. And the important result is that we get the exact same uh, uh, pattern uh, when we apply this decoding analysis to the activity generated during imagery. Okay? So as you go from voxel populations for, that have no tuning to low-level visual features to those that do, you get a monotonic increase in your ability to decode a mental image. Right? And if we just uh, re restrict um, our voxel selection procedure to those that are in V1 or V2, we see that it, it, it just very, I mean, it's, it's perfectly consistent with the, the pattern in the general population. So I think this, this result really uh, answers uh, the, the, this issue, our question in the affirmative. Um, representations of low-level visual features do contribute to mental imagery, even for complex images. Right? That leads to a question, an obvious question, why is mental imagery so obviously different from perception? And by obviously different, I mean that the decoding accuracy is worse. It's good, but it's worse. And also our mental images are easy, at least for sane people, to discriminate from uh, images that we see in front of us, from external images. 
I think we can uh, begin to get an answer to this question by considering mental imagery as a component of predictive coding. So consider a predictive coding network which encodes a probabilistic model, namely a joint distribution over a set of visual features, X and Y. Each one of the nodes in this, um, in this network is associated with one of the visual features. There are descending connections which communicate predictions based on prior information of what the feature value should be. And then there are ascending um, connections which communicate the error of those predictions. And by a dynamic exchange of these errors and predictions, the model is able to determine the set of visual features that is most probable when the sensory node, which receives no feedback, is set to a particular image, S star. And in the linear Gaussian case, the, conver the uh, state that it converges on is just a filtered version of the stimulus that's presented. Okay. Now we can, what happens in this model when we imagine S star? Okay. So to, to describe that, we're going to set the sensory input to an uninformative value, we just set it to zero. We're going to clamp one of the higher level nodes to the value that it would be if um, the S star had been perceived. Excuse me. Right? And then we're going to let the remaining nodes converge. And when we do that, we get a nice, in the, at least in the linear Gaussian case, a really nice, simple, and intuitive result. The, the value that you get, the pattern of activity you get during imagery, is just a linear combination of the uh, filtered version that you got, or the, the pattern of activity that you got during perception. Right? So this is the receptive field, and this would be the imagery receptive field. Now, what is the effect of this linear transformation? Well, given what we know about the organization of, of um, feedback connections, namely that they're, that they're roughly topographic, um, the most likely effect is that you're going to lose spatial resolution. So this model says that your activity during imagery should represent a blurred version of your activity during perception. Okay. So, and, and this is a nice result, I think, because it, it explains why we were able to decode mental images using a receptive field F, but also why re uh, mental images are approximations to seeing, and why the, activity, or why the ability to decode mental imagery was worse. Okay, and that brings us to my answer to the uh, questions, uh, the discussion questions. I think the most important thing that, to address, uh, not surprisingly, is exactly what I'm working on. Um, what are the effects of top-down signaling on early visual processing? And again, not too surprising, I think the way to do this is to develop more encoding models. Um, and with that, I will thank uh, my collaborators, uh, particularly Cheryl Ullman uh, and Camille Ugerbell at the University of Minnesota, and acknowledge my funding sources. And uh, we'll move on.